Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring music, education, technology, and the intersections between them, with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. Thanks to my sponsor this week, Light the Music. Thanks also to this month's Patreon supporters, Emmanuel and Kristen. Thanks for supporting the show. If you want to support Music Ed Tech Talk, you can head on over to patreon.com slash musicedtechtalk and join one of the four support tiers, all of which include access to the Music Ed Tech Talk Discord server, where you can join the community in talking about those subjects and more. Also, please note that the audio on this episode is like a little less uh, touched up than usual. I ended up using mostly the Zoom call since this is a higher volume of guests than I'm used to editing. So uh, most of the tracks you're going to hear are taken just straight from the Zoom recording. So uh, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Music Ed Tech Talk holiday special. Is it the 2021 holiday special if I'm publishing it? First thing, 2022. If it's a New Year's special, it's like the New Year's special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my idea, right? It's like yeah. the but that but New Year's it's itself. It's like we have the New Year, but people celebrate kind of like the night before, and generally sort of lump a lot of holidays festivities into the end of December. I don't know what what I need to call it. What year it is, but it is. It is the the first annual Music Ed Tech Talk holiday special. And I have four very special guests with me. I've never done four guests. I've only ever had two. So I'm pumped. I'm excited. We have some highly structured, deeply engaging roundtable questions we're going to ask each other. This is not going to be like when you go to a panel at a conference and you're bored out of your mind. This is going to be excite excitement. Wall to wall excitement. you're on a Zoom and you're <laughs> bored out of your mind. I can't relate to this. I don't know what you're talking about. I've never, never been to one of those. I, so I think what I should probably do is just assume that anyone who's listening to this knows where to find out more about me if you're subscribed to this show. So why don't we, are, are, you, are you all aligned in the Zoom the same way that I see you? Like I have Craig in the upper left and then there's me and then Will in the upper right. No, not even. Okay, that's fun. Zoom should be more consistent about that because then this would be easier. Can we use the order that's on the dock? I was just going to say, let's go dock. Let's go doc. And that's how we'll like, we'll just basically like, if I ask the first question, then we'll go like David will so on, so on, so on down the list. And then, all right, we're ready. We're ready to go. The goal is that we don't spend more than like a minute or two on each question. Famous last words. Do we want to introduce ourselves in order of the doc too, starting with Dr. David McDonald? I'm David McDonald. I'm a composer and I teach music composition theory and technology at Wichita State University. And I am a contributor to and co-host of the Scoring Notes. My name is Will Kuhn and I teach music technology at Lebanon High School in Ohio. And I wrote a couple books on the topic and I don't, I don't have a show. But I will link those very good books in the show notes to this episode. <laughs> Hey, I'm Craig McClellan. I am a former professional musician turned elementary school teacher turned ed tech professional. So I've had a weird winding uh, path, but somehow that intersects really well with everything that Robbie does. And I used to have a podcast with Robbie called The Class Nerd. And yeah, I think that's good. Oh, I am in Auburn, Alabama. That's where I'm coming to you from today. Craig, I really liked your intro because one of my dreams has been to start some kind of thing, a podcast or a blog or something that tracks people's various pivots in life, mm -hmm. probably career pivots, but it doesn't even have to be career pivots. I'm just someone who's fascinated by all of the different directions that people take things in life. So I am John Tippins. I'm a software engineer. I currently work at Google. And in two days, I will be a recording artist with my first release out. Congrats. I'm going to kick it off with our first question, and that is, What's one technology workflow you started in 2021 that you would consider sticky, meaning that you will keep doing it moving forward? Like this is just something you do now. I will start and I have gone on to the, I'm on the personal knowledge management train. I'm using a couple of apps that like kind of you write, they're like note apps to be brief, but that where you can like sort of link certain notes to other notes in a network of interconnected thoughts. And there are tools that these kinds of applications provide that make it really easy to sort of like track the different relationships between your different ideas. The one I'm using the most is called Obsidian, but I'm using another one I really like called Craft. And I don't know if these two apps specifically will be in my life forever, but this kind of way of writing is definitely, I think, here to stay for a while. 
so the thing for me that I started doing in 2021, and this kind of goes back to 2020 a little bit, but is making lots of short videos for announcements to introduce assignments to my students instead of just writing a set of instructions to actually like be in like a, you know, three to 10 minute YouTube video going over it, demonstrating it on screen and using that for announcements, for going over assignments instead of using class time. I don't have a ton of time with my students. I don't have as much as I would like. And so this lets me like not use class time for that and still do it in an engaging way that they can revisit. I can go fast because they can stop and rewatch if they want. And so that's the thing that I started doing in 2021 that I think I'm going to keep doing for a long time. So, so I always find it annoying to when I give demos and presentations to have to use a document camera or some kind of awkward tripod thing to like point a camera down at the push. So I'm using this thing that's like I've got this fold up gooseneck stand and I'm using my phone with OBS and the app OBS cam to like get a camera feed of downward facing camera that packs up small in a backpack and I don't have to bring a bunch of extra wires. It's pretty great. I'm probably going to keep using that to present off of. Nice. I'm going to talk about this more probably in my tech tip, but I think Apple's focus modes is probably going to be the stickiest thing for me of the year. I really like being able to have like a work home screen on my phone that like, because I've been off for the last few weeks, I haven't seen. So my e work email app hasn't been showing me notifications, any of that. And I've been able to kind of keep that hidden while I've been on vacation. And, but then when I do need to work, I can hide all the personal stuff. So that's, that's been huge. Awesome. Yeah. On my end. So I think the technology workflow that I started that is definitely here to stay is having a, a mountable camera that allows you to control where it's looking from your phone. So if you do anything with video, you know, anything video related, and we've already had a couple of folks talk about that, it's super helpful rather than having to like find your subject by physically controlling where the camera is pointed, right? Just find a camera that allows you to mount it and then you can control where it's looking from your phone. That's been super, super helpful. A particular product I used to do that is the DJI Pocket 2, but there's so many different options for that. Oh, cool. My second question is, keeping with this topic of stickiness, uh, what is one trend in music, music tech, ed tech, or music education that you saw this year? And I guess I'm just gonna also include in this like sort of the, a lot of, because a lot of, trends kind of started while a lot of people were virtual learning. So any kind of trend in any of these industries that you see as similarly, like not being some sort of fad or temporary response to new learning models, but something that actually is going to be with us in five or more years. Do you want to start or you want me to start? I guess, yeah, I do start since I'm asking the, the question. However you want. Yeah, no, it's good. We're refining and shaping this process. That's why it's the first annual music ed tech talk holiday special. So I think that if someone, this is a super boring answer to this question, but I, I think like if someone didn't, someone didn't already use a learning management system, they probably do now. I'm always in a fight with Canvas, which is our school district's learning management software. But one thing that I definitely think it leverages as a strength is sort of like the flexibility and like interconnectivity of lots of different web technologies. So the fact that like I can have a student like be given yeah. some assignment instructions inside of your canvas assignment page, but then that can link out to some other internet tool, like a Google doc or like a sound trap, you know, like a digital audio workstation. I think that we're gonna continue to see, you know, also like keep, keeping in mind, like the affordability of things like Chromebooks. I think we're gonna continue to see web software be kind of the standard in education and like get continuously like easier to use and like interconnect different removed bits. I was going to go somewhere else with this, but hearing your answer, Robbie, reminded me that I think one thing that I saw, and this is like a lot of these things probably will be, has existed for a while, but became much more widely adopted in 2021. And that is different forms of automated assessment in music. That's such an important thing for students to get immediate feedback without having to wait for something from a teacher throughout the week and for me teaching music theory like things like this have existed for a long time but the the methods and the 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 power of these tools has increased a lot just in the last few months even musician and m-u-s-i-t-i-o-n just added a feature that will automatically grade part writing and we can talk about the value of that i don't hold it as highly as some other people do but the idea that that sort of thing could exist and automate itself is really powerful. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that 
going forward? Yeah, I feel like, um, you know, it's, it's like a trend in that, like we had it before and now everybody did it and they had to do it. And now they're going to keep doing it is, uh, is streaming your events, whether, whether you're allowed to or not, nobody cares anymore. Everybody wants that stream. <laughs> and it's something that they kind of expect now. So, and you, when you have like a big event, like it doesn't have it, it's kind of surprising now. So I think that's probably here to stay is some sort of uh, apparatus to stream and record being a, an expected feature of your performing space. I'm glad that I moved away from that being my answer because I, that was one of the things when I was kind of looking through our questions that I had, had thought about. For me, I, I think there's going to continue. There has started being kind of an increased look at student data, data privacy with, you know, all these at the beginning of the pandemic, all these tools coming and saying, teachers, use this for free, use this for free, we'll let you have it. And now, I mean, there are laws, uh, California and New York and uh, Illinois have actual laws around this. And uh, I think school districts are now starting to really kind of take a look and go, oh my gosh, what are we using? And how do we kind of rein this in so that we know that the tools that using are safe? And I, I don't know that it's always going to be on the minds of teachers. And as a former teacher, I get that. Like that's, there are a lot of things that you're having to deal with. But I think as a whole, the ed tech community is, start, is going to start looking at that a lot more seriously. I am picking up on a theme. I think a trend that is here to stay is remote collaboration among musicians, producers, singers, recording artists. I met so many people this year that I didn't know before on Zoom, you know. And, and we're doing it now. And I just have this sense, I don't have any data or evidence to back it up, that now that we know that this can be very effective and it is, it's always gonna be a tool in our toolbox, even when we're not forced to do it. Okay, question three. What is one piece of software that you wish more people used? And I, I tried to leave this kind of open-ended, but I'm gonna just personally answer this question with the interpretation of like, like my music team, for example, there's like a lot of software we use in collaboration with one another. And some of those are things that I've like fought battles to win them to. And then other things they're like, get it away. So like an example of a thing that they sort of like mostly enjoy using is Slack, which is a team communication tool. But something that I really think would be great if we would do together, but that they're just like, no way, pen and paper is some sort of like task collaboration app. I've tried Trello, I've tried Todoist. We actually do use Trello for like, not so much for like checkable to-do stuff, but more so for like a variety of other kinds of problem solutions to different problems. But yeah, just like some sort of like shared list of like, here's like a list of things we gotta do before a concert and we can all just sort of like look at them in the same place and check them off. I know that's not popular amongst all people, but that would be my thing. I would really appreciate it if more people that I collaborate with would adopt craft with me. I'm going to try to limit the amount of gushing about craft that I do on this particular podcast episode, but I am a huge fan of the way collaboration works there. And I would love to be able to collaborate with more people there instead of on things like Google Docs. I, <clears throat> piece of software, the phone app, you know, like where you call people, like, <laughs> why do we, why do we have to use it? Like, can we just like call me? We'll talk it out. <laughs> We'll figure out what needs to happen. We move forward. It used to be so simple. I don't know uh, if, if it's like an actual like app though. Like I wish, I wish more people. Used, I think that's great. Um, I, I don't know. I just wish more people used like default apps, like, like Safari instead of having to install a bunch of, bunch of crap and sync and sign it. I just wish people would test against like generic setups, like, like our, our web filtering, like I have to be like, not just using Chrome to see the YouTube link of our stream, but I have to be synced, signed in. Google Chrome is like fully hooked into the matrix for like the secure thing to like work. And it's like, man, that's just like, that's no good. Like you should have made that work with everything. That's my answer. Good answer. I am going to go with whatever the current version of iOS is, just that people would update their phones. Like it would save me so much tech support <laughs> hassle if things were just updated. Or, you know, my wife is still on iOS 14. I think 15.2 is what's out right now. And there are times when she's like, how did you do that? I'm like, oh, cause I 
have the latest if you just update. You know, no, there are no problems in our marriage with that at all. But yeah, that's my answer. The whatever, always keeping our iOS up to date. I'm going to try to not become the rabbit hole king here, but I have to ask Craig, I'm just, I'm interested in this, in this answer that you're making, because as an iOS user myself, one of the things I have speculated about is like, is there anything else Apple could do that they're not already doing to practically force people to always be on the latest iOS? So I guess the first part of my question is, are you talking specifically about iOS or are you talking about updating apps on iOS? Because I do agree. I think updating apps on iOS, that can be, that can be a lagging thing, but short of sending police to my front door to force me to like, my phone will do everything in its power to force me to, to be on the latest iOS. Even like, I feel like Apple's whole automatically update overnight thing never works. I think oh, okay. she has like, my wife has that turned on, but it doesn't ever update. So I, I think okay. there is some things Apple could do to make that better. I have a theory that they purposefully always, the emoji update is always like 0.1 or 0.2. I feel like they know the bugs will have been worked out and everyone's going to want those sweet new emoji. So they jump on it so that they don't have little uh, like fun, funny looking characters. And then by then, you know, they get like all the fancy new stuff, like the widgets or whatever, and then hopefully less bugs. Don't even get me started on all those audio guys that stay five versions behind. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I think Craig's onto something. Though, that the the auto update mojo is is messed up in some places. I know I often I have my my app store set to automatically update all my apps, but if I ever go to the update page, there's almost always at least one app that hasn't updated in two weeks or something. Yeah, hmm. nice. My answer is a little bit both software and hardware, so I, I hope it still counts. But software is a huge part of it. I started using this. This is going to be confusing because there's a sheet music company called Muse. There's a, there's a music uh, notation company called Muse, but this is a meditation device called Muse. It's the, the hardware component is that it, it, you wear it. It's, it's a wearable on your head, forehead, and it can sense some amount of brain activity. I don't know enough about neurotransmitters to know exactly what it's doing, but the software component is that it, um, it has software that reacts in real time. To, to what your brain is doing as you meditate. And why am I advocating for this? It, it has kept my meditation more consistent. That's the, that's the thing about it. I don't actually know how to divide correlation and causation with this device. Like I can't tell you that it's actually improving anything. I haven't, I'm not, I don't have the scientific data to say that, but I can say that I meditate more often because of it. And um, I'll just briefly go into the, the experience of it is that there's a sonic landscape that it creates or your meditation practice. And as brain activity changes, the sonic landscape changes with it. And it is very quick. It's a very rapid reactive sonic uh, environment that they've created. So that's the basic experience. That's cool. Hmm. I have more questions and also maybe jokes that'll <laughs> exceed the limit. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna joke before you said that it actually plays, does anything like plays anything. And you were talking about just the brainwave activity. I was going to joke that actually it's just a solid piece of plastic and they're banking on you <laughs> saying that yeah, thing you wait. said about how you meditate more. <laughs> as I revisit, as I revisit this, it does seem like I just bought one, you know, something off like a cheap ad that you see in, in like a Facebook marketplace thing, like $2 meditation device changed this person's life. You don't believe be, what happens next. Right. My <laughs> second joke was going to be there's, that there's no no place in the world you possibly saw that advertised other than Instagram. <laughs> it's a reputable company. You can look them up. This is not the All right. I'm curious. I'll link it. I'll link it in the notes. I actually have been, spoiler alert, doing some meditation this year. And so I have like, I'm pretty curious about that. This episode of Music Ed Tech Talk and this month of the blog is sponsored by Light the Music. You can find them at lightthemusic.com. Light the Music empowers educators to ignite student creativity and collaboration. Using a digital audio workstation, students learn about the fundamentals of music while creating their own music that is authentic, relevant, and meaningful to them. Light the Music provides a curriculum aligned with the creating strand of the National Core Arts Standards. As students are introduced to the technology tools, they create an artist's profile to guide their work throughout the curriculum. Students then learn about the elements that make up a piece of music. Rhythm, chords, bass, and melody. They learn concepts by recreating and remixing, then use that knowledge to create something new. In each lesson, students share their work with classmates to give and receive feedback that is kind, specific, honest, and helpful. The Light the Music curriculum comprises eight units and 26 lessons, containing tutorial videos, templates, resources, and slides to make teaching easy. 
In each lesson, students learn, practice, and apply new skills. The curriculum offers a scaffolded structure for teachers to sequence lessons, yet contains enough flexibility for students to get support or dive deeper when desired. Students will work towards creating their own piece of music and a video to go along with it. At the conclusion of the eight units, students share their work in a final showcase. Light the Music is ideal for students in 6th through 12th grade general music, music technology, music appreciation, or any other music course where student creativity is a goal. Additional standalone lesson plans for teachers looking for a one-time project are also available. If you'd like to learn more, check out www.lightthemusic.com. So I, I, in, in our introductions, I realized that my first question makes an assumption about everyone on this Zoom call that may not be true, that I, I don't know if everyone here went to music school. But my, my question is, uh, what's something you wish you were, you were taught in music school? And if you didn't go to music school, what, what you wish you were taught in your scholarly training? I, will, I'll, I guess I, I'll go first. I wish I was taught about songwriting. I'm a composer by trade, and I learned a lot about making weird abstract chamber music, and I know next to nothing about writing a song. And I wish that I knew more about that and, and could, could do that. My whole thing is like a reaction to that. Like, I wish I was taught all of the like electronic music production techniques that were available then. I guess there's one, if, I, if that's what I wish I was taught, what I wish they would just teach to everybody is just like how how live sound reinforcement works. I feel like that's pretty necessary and nobody knows it. Totally. For me, I think, so I had a kind of a weird trajectory. I did go to music school. I started playing guitar when I was a sophomore in high school and then fell in love with it and ended up studying it in college. But like, that's not a long period of time to be playing your instrument or be like, really connected to it. And so I feel like I didn't know how to practice my instrument very well. And that was kind of expected, like when I got to music school. And so I would feel like I never really got the hang of like, here are some things you should do when you're practicing. It. And what does that actually look like? Instead of me just kind of going, I'm just going to play this song. Um, so that's, that's my answer. I want to give an, an enormous plus one to the, to the points about songwriting and also uh, mu recording. And it's, I'll, I'll br very brief tangent. I do think there's some kind of divide. Like I think at the top music schools, this stuff is just available, right? Like if you go to Berkeley or, or some of the other popular ones, it's like, yeah, songwriting and recording. It's like the first thing, it's probably like one of the first things that people enroll in. But that wasn't really a thing when I was in, in at, at my music school, not that it was a bad music school. And I think that is representative of a lot of music schools out there. But the, the thing that I'll contribute here is that some people teach this, some people do not. I think it's so important. It's just like how to create, how to be intentional about creating an emotional connection with your audience. I think we teach technical elements of music, yeah. which are very important, right? Play your scales, play this piece well, articulation, <laughs> right? And those are great. And those are really important, but they're all in service of creating an emotional, most of the time, they're in service of creating some kind of emotional connection. And uh, I think that's one of the things that, because I do, I did learn, spend so much time on technique and, and technical elements of music that I have to constantly remind myself, like make this emotional. That's, yeah, that's I, a good, I, I like interpretation broadly. Like you, they just say, you know, do it like I do it or do it like this recording does it. And nobody talks about why. Totally. And, and I feel like a lot of people that came, I went to Belmont University in Nashville, and a lot of people that came out of there, they, the songs that they wrote and the things that they did were so complex that they didn't connect with it. And it's like, there's a reason why GCD E minor is so popular. Like it connects with people better than being super complicated. And there are ways to find that balance but you have to find the balance if you're going to make it complicated. And a lot of folks that I know weren't good at that. Yeah. Nice. You all gave super good answers. So I'm going to kind of like answer this a little bit differently. I, a lot of the things that I think that I like that I wish were included in my music education are things that I am really lucky to have had, had access to outside of the actual coursework I did, or at least like I had the curiosity to go and like find the resources to learn those things. But when I was in grad school, I took uh, a handful of jazz courses. And when I took jazz theory and then later jazz arranging, um, 
that really changed the way that I thought music theory. Uh, I, I wish I had taken it first or that the freshman year entry music theory course had been taught with the same attention to listening that that my you know that because like my my you know i took it when i was in grad school this jazz theory class but there was it was full of undergraduate students but the thing is is that the jazz department at the university of maryland also had a lot of like local freelancers and like um, military band musicians who were already like very very proficient players and like had been in the field who were also just taking it to get their degree and like having that collaboration and contribution from them and then like hearing people never like no chord was ever talked about outside of its relationship to like what it's making you hear or feel or like what's working in the composition of that progression. And I just like remember in my, you know, undergraduate theory courses, like needing to spend lots of outside time, like poking at the piano to make sure I was like really understanding things. So I wanted to understand like what exactly which you all are saying about like that kind of like auditory or even emotional connection that the music was making. So I would just, I don't know if that's like, uh, I would rather course be taught that way or i think everyone i mean i do think everyone should take jazz theory but that would kind of be my contribution to that all right this was such a good question do y'all mind if i add just one more observation here go for it this is a question that i try to ask every like professional in the field that i encounter because this is like what i do I, I try to figure out what my students will benefit most from so i am always interested in hearing what people have to say about this question i wish i had been taught that if you're an instrumentalist, anyone can sing. Yes. Right? And then on the flip side, if you're a singer, you can learn music. You too can can do musics. That has been the biggest like thing that I have learned post music education is like, whoa, you know, I wish I had learned this sooner. It would have changed a lot. Yeah, definitely. There are people who can do both. It's funny how like some of my own assumptions are based on that kind of those those polar ideas of like just the kinds of musicians I encountered because I think of like I was listening to I've been listening to a bunch of gospel music lately and I'm always like reminded whenever I think about someone like Kirk Franklin like whenever I like watch an interview with him or like any kind of behind the scenes like how he can start, I don't know how much you all like know Kirk Franklin but like when I or, or just really any pop musician like Michael Jackson might be an, another example like someone who is like you sort of think of them as like this like forward-facing icon of the music or like this entertainment kind of piece but actually when you see like how much they had their hand in every layer of the music that's going on you realize like oh you actually can be the total package musician and like possess all of these different kinds of skills in one and that's kind of how I feel whenever I see like a super competent singer who also like has great instrumental skill or like compositional skill I always think to myself like yeah all that knowledge and experience is there for the taking it's just not like super like centered on in the music school totally totally so my next question and this is a much simpler question I hope is how do you use your computer's desktop do you do you, are the things that you store there like permanently or is it organized to do what what lives on your computer's desktop for me I, I try very much to to only use it for a, a current thing and I don't generally even keep files there overnight. I have my browsers all set to download files to the desktop. I don't use the downloads folder unless an app won't let me change that. And as soon as I download it, I use it and delete it or put it in the place that it belongs. But I, I do, I'm not a person that keeps files or icons or shortcuts or anything on my desktop. I use the stacks feature and keep them pretty empty. Because I've always used it so it looks like that anyway. Just the hard drive and a couple things that, you know, I want to remember to have out that maybe I need to do something about in the future. And I, I've always used my computer so that it looks like as close to the default as possible. Nice. I, uh, I use it as just kind of temporary holding space. Uh, screenshots show up there. I create a lot of screenshots for my customers or like temporary storage for files. But I have an application called Hazel that uh, cleans up. I, I don't remember if I've got it set to, if something is a week old or if it's two weeks old, but it cleans it off eventually. And so I've been off work for the last two weeks. And so my desktop is completely clean. So, you know, it's temporary and then it gets taken care of. If, if it's something I actually need, I'll move it somewhere where Hazel's not gonna delete it. Yeah, I'm right there with you, Craig. It's for me, it's mostly screenshots. It's mostly temporary things I clean out maybe, you know, once a quarter. And there's two aliases. Man, I love I love this question so much and these answers because I don't know if you know this, but I wrote a book about being digitally organized in the music classroom. And there's a before 
in an after picture somewhere in one of the chapters of like a messy chaotic desktop and then a really clean one and i have just taken such a 180 on this over the past few years so i would say like in general the desktop is a temporary storage place for me but like temporary you need to interpret that very very loosely like things stay there for quite a long time and there's a few features that have made this possible the first of them is stacks i definitely use the stacks just to keep it a little tidy. The second is like the whole thing where you can make your documents and your desktop sync over iCloud. So like if I've got some temporary stuff, it doesn't matter if it's a day old or a month old. If I have that syncing across all my devices, it doesn't really matter where I put it as long as it's in iCloud. And uh, a lot of things I get to through the recents view in the file system, not even like they're going to a specific location. I've saved it. Like I've got a very shallow in simple foldering system that I eventually put stuff in kind of related to what projects or areas of life they belong to, but stuff, stuff, I've got a lot of stuff on my desktop right now. And it's totally fine because like, what even is a computer? Like what is a file system? I, this is, I asked this, like, I read that I keep talking about this. This is like the fourth episode in a row. I mentioned this, that, that verge thing from like, that came out on the verge, like a couple months ago about how, like the current generation of college students don't know how to like use a file system and like it's true like there's something to be said for like when i go to my google docs i know that like the kind of work i'd made you know i know it's going to be docs.google.com and it's it's going to probably be in the top three hits if i was working on it within the past month so i don't know i kind of take that approach to the file system i use recents a lot eventually i move things from the desktop to the documents folder where i've got some subfolders but that's that's Robbie, that. is, th is this the episode where we dub the the digital maria condo I mean, like, there's definitely a lot of stuff on my desktop that does not give me joy, but it at one point did. I, I mean, looking right here, you know what? Wanna like, what do I have here? Do you really want? To, I didn't plan on. Okay, so the st way the stacks are organized, there's like a yesterday, and then a previous seven days, and then a previous thirty days, and then it starts going by the month. I guess that's. You know what? I used to have it organized by file type, but I kind of like this better. It's, but it, yeah, it's like you all said, it's mostly screenshots. I have a lot of folders. I do a folder for every episode of the show. And then I just need to basically dump all the screenshots, screenshots that I made, you know, for producing all my posts and my podcast episodes. I just got to dump those in the right folders and then move the folders to the music at tech talk folder in my documents. But that's, I mean, I don't know. That's kind of my flow. It's just really, it's, it, it is like quite a lot of stuff that's on there right now. So my, my last music ed tech question for everyone is if you could imagine a piece of software or hardware into existence, what would it be? And for me, this is a very simple th thing that I have for several years now. I currently carry around a 13 inch iPad Pro, uh, a 2018 iPad Pro. And at home on my desk, I have a 27 inch iMac and I would like those two to be the same device. I, I want my my 27 inch iMac to be on a, a big swivel hinge thing like the Microsoft Surface Studio. And I would like it to when it goes into its its big giant tablet mode to start running iOS. And then when I put it back into stand up and use the keyboard mode to go back to Mac OS mode. And I don't really think that's too much to ask. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, I'd like that too. I think I would also like, this is like, just like such a specific stupid problem, but like, can the audio input jack on every camera just have a limiter on it? Is that <laughs> too hard to ask? Like, can it just do that? Like, why is that something I have to ask for? So that's, that's my most recent That's one. good. That's a good one. <laughs> so I'm going to pivot my answer now, based on what you said, David, I love to work from iPad OS. I've got the same iPad you do. I've got the magic keyboard, but a lot, so much of my work is Zoom and I'm, I'm Zooming with, with customers all day. And iPad's just not good for that because I can't take notes on the meeting off to the side. I oftentimes am on with multiple members of my team and a customer and we're slacking on the side to make sure we're all in alignment. And you can't do that with an iPad. And I, but in general, when I'm working, I love the window management of an iPad so much more than a Mac. And, and so I would kill for better, like external display support. And, and I don't, I don't want to overcomplicate the, the window management of iPad OS because it's part of what I love. But if I could just put Zoom on another screen and have my iPad in front of me, 
that would save my life. I would, I would love it. I would get so much more done. Mine's a little bit different domain here. I think everyone wants this in, in 2021, like perfect remote music jamming without any lag. Yeah. Uh, I actually mm. think this would possibly change the world. I can jam with someone in Japan, Thailand, Russia, Ukraine, wherever, Brazil. Let's go. Let's just jam right now. See you in Second Life. Yeah. No, that'd be really cool. All right. I too am inspired by David's answer. I have too many computers. I don't like having stuff. I get a lot of stuff because I like solving problems, but I would ultimately like to solve the same problems with less stuff. So like I too have an iPad and a Mac and an iPhone, but every time I'm using my iPad, I'm thinking like, wow, I love this touch screen and this Apple pencil. I love reading my scores on it. But when I attach it to a keyboard and a trackpad, I'm like, cool, this is like a laptop, but it doesn't have this like one utility that I want. It is literally in every other way, shape or form, like capable of running almost all of the same software I have on my Mac. And it's the same on the Mac. I'm like, I've got all my software. I've got it set and tweaked just the way that I like it. But like, then there's just like this weird percentage of things where I'm like, well, I got to sign a PDF. I can't like do that with my Apple pencil. I got to, you know, like to me, I would love, I don't know, this is, I don't know how this problem would be solved, but I would love some sort of like small MacBook that did have either flip back or have some sort of detachable screen that, I don't know, even if it just like ran iOS apps when it was detached, I don't know. I, this is a whole lot of mess into the equation, but I would, I would rather have one portable, powerful machine with a touch screen on it than two. Dude, hey man, and let me, let, let me, let me say this about like, we're talking iPad rants here. Like there's, there's all these little things that like it can't do that you're so close and you know that it could if they wanted it to and they just don't want it to. Yeah. And the one that I ran into that just like drove me nuts is I just want to tell it the Wi-Fi network priority. That's all I want. I want to be able to say when the EMG Wi-Fi network is on, that's the one. And when it's I've got off, an even that's simpler not the one. one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My, my company is a Microsoft shop. So we use Office 365, OneDrive for everything. And one thing I have to use my MacBook for instead of an iPad is I have created a bunch of templates for documents and I can use those on the Mac. I cannot mm. have my own templates in Microsoft Word on an iPad. Why? Yeah. Why? It's, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it's like the computer that you can't break. But okay. But like now they're, you know, they say it's for pros and they say, you know, you can do all this stuff. And there's just, it's arbitrary constraints. It's just like for people who don't want to be able to do things is what I'm kind of concluding. Yeah. yeah. It's funny though, because like what, what I think like the idea of like, okay, making the computer unbreakable, I hear more people who are unfamiliar with the technology getting totally lost in the whole multitasking system than who get lost in the system preferences because there are more options to click. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Should we go into Will's questions? Yeah. All right, guys, here's the buzzwords. Are Web3 blockchain and NFTs a real mark of progress or just a fancy way for rich people to launder money? <laughs> I have a former student who I follow on Instagram, who is like a total crypto bro. And he moved to Thailand and like ex, ex, exported like all his money. And like, now he were, runs some weird startup that's like Spotify, but your artists are in control of the ownership of the, you buy the NFTs of the people's songs or whatever. And it's like, I, I'm having trouble I'm having trouble with it. I like to think forward. I like to try to see what's over the horizon. And I'm having trouble thinking of like use cases for this stuff beyond money laundering. It's I, I'm not an expert. I have no, like, I understand what an NFT is to an extent, but that's about it. I am the wrong person for this question. I'm interested in it, but I've not put the time in to even really think about where it's going or anything like that. Well, And, and, and you know what? Let me add to this is like, Part of me wants to just write it all off, but then, you know, I listen to like Holly Herndon's podcast where she's like really passionate about it and she's an artist. She's not just a rich person money laundering. And it's like, it, there's something there, but I can't tell exactly what it is or what I would ever need it for. Yeah, I, I, I definitely wouldn't pretend to be an expert. Nevertheless, like everyone else, I have an opinion. So I think the simplest way for me to answer this question is today it's mostly the latter. 
but I do think there are narrow use cases that we could see really develop with real utility. And one use case that I've seen discussed that I think could have be promising is like getting rid of like ticket scalping problems. You know how like you want to go to the show and then all the tickets are immediately gone within 30 seconds and then they're just being mm. resold at higher values. I do think a distributed ledger is a good way to manage that problem that we don't have today. So I do think there are going to be mm. narrow, very narrow cases where this thing could really help. This technology can really help today. The main issue why it, I don't think it's going to be working for artists or, you know, people who care about intellectual property anytime soon is because it's not enforceable in the courts right now. So if you have some, let's say you just have some string of numbers and symbols that means that you own something, right? There's no court that's going to say like, well, you know, Will, you copied John's song and this string of numbers says that it's John's song, so you need to pay John. Right. Without that infrastructure there, with you have no IP. Until that happens, all of this stuff is essentially speculative in my mind. Yeah, I I, I kind of think of these. I only like very generally understand all of these ideas, and I understand them enough to know that I think that like they are technologies that maybe like we have just haven't. Like I think that the the technologies themselves are important and will contribute somehow to the future. I just don't know if like the way that we're using them now. I, I mean, I think of like, like an idea I can really easily wrap my head around just kind of coming back to touch screens. Tell me we were going off on touch screens a second ago. Like a touch screen was not like really a marketable thing until it was like put together in the right package with the right other things. Like, I don't know if like NFTs are like the blockchain. I don't know if any of these technologies, like the way that we currently see them are compelling to the masses, but they certainly might like if bits of them are sort of taken from one another and reconstructed along with some better vision and like packaging of some future idea, then I guess we've yet to see what that is. Yeah, well, along the those lines, I think like uh, blockchain is an interesting technology and it's, it's in a lot of ways like a platform like any other platform in, in search of its killer app still. And I, I don't think NFTs are it. I, I think NFTs are, are kind of a fad. And I think John's suggestion about event ticketing on the blockchain is a really interesting one. And I think much in the same way, like one of the things that, that I think is really interesting is the contract written in such a way that the original uh, creator of the token or the artwork or whatever gets some piece of resale, which has often not been the case with art that, you know, they sell the original, the artist sells the original. And then after that, if the value of the thing goes way, way up, the artist doesn't get anything of that. And I think NFTs are really interesting for that reason. It's really the only reason that I find NFTs interesting. Nothing else about it interests me really. But I, I, I also think it's possible that the blockchain could potentially play some kind of role in credentials or licensing or something like that of, of prof like professional licensing. I, I do think there are a lot of ways in which credentialism in the stuff that we do is is rightfully kind of going out of style and we're finding other ways to do that. But I think there are certain kinds of things that credentials are still useful for and maybe some kind of like micro-credential system that's not like a degree, but is some kind of certification maybe the blockchain could be a useful place to to store something like that. But in general, I think it's it's a little bit orthogonal to the things that, that we do and often talk about on this podcast. So I've, I've heard some of those ideas before. And I wonder, like, I mean, aren't these things a little bit like, they're a little bit like Bitcoins, right? Where like, if you physically lose this, your chunk of the code or whatever, it's lost is that like correct so like if i lose the thing with my nft it's it's lost or if like i'm locked out of that you know bit of wallet or whatever i'm keeping it in so like i feel like it goes backwards in some ways but with the digital scarcity where like i don't ever have to worry about losing my teaching license because i know that somebody else has a copy of me. you know what i mean so I, I just think it's kind of interesting that I, think I don't get the, that. The answer to that specific question, Will, is maybe. And here's why. If you have a ledger, the whole idea behind a ledger, right, is that you have a record that won't go away. So David was talking about cases where you could use that to store credentials. Like you could say, John has a degree from so-and-so, and that means he can practice dentistry or whatever. So if you have this ledger, that's not going anywhere. It's supported by the, the network. 
So it doesn't matter. So what, what if there's like you still need the identifier uh, though, and like the wallet ID is the thing that that you need to be able to unlock to demonstrate that you're you. And I think that yeah, yeah. So that's the second, but that's the you 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 jump you you got there before I was. So it, it depends on how it's implemented. If there were an identity and if there was identity infrastructure, right, tying me to my credential, like if you could look at my eye or if you could look at some kind of thing that is attached to me that I can't lose, right. Authentication is a, is, a, is a hard problem. We know that. But if you, if you have good authentication, you won't lose the le you know, your place in the ledger, if that makes sense. Huh. Interesting. OK. The rest of these questions will be on sale as NFTs, so you can <laughs> uh, purchase them to proceed. <laughs> so, uh, OK, my next question. I'm going on to my next question, right? It sounds great. Um, okay. So this is like the opposite end of the spectrum. What's like a regular person tech thing that you slept on that's actually kind of useful. And I guess the, the ring security system is mine for that because I bought a new house that had one and I was like, oh, this is sweet, actually. Totally slept on it. Totally a blind spot. Had no idea how good this stuff was. My answer might be a little... Uh cheeky i don't know it's kind of anti-technology but like for so long i was like the paperless guy like there i will not have a sheet of paper anywhere on my desk nothing and now like i really like having a notepad on my desk and a nice pen and like being able to take notes that way and eventually i put it in the computer but like pen and paper man is like so good and i was so my wife still teases me now that she's like you are the one who's into like nice paper and pens that's shocking but i, I love it it's, it helps my brain i have retained stuff better it's uh, all around pen and paper i like that plus one to that let's see regular folk tech thing so uh using siri to book calendar events for some reason, I haven't been doing that, but I started doing that. And it's like, wow, I'm not missing my events anymore. I'm showing up on time. It's great. Use, you know, oh, use nice. Siri or, or some, use Siri or some, you know, whatever your platform offers to book your calendar events. The other one is a powerful cordless vacuum. I'm talking here specifically about like a Dyson like vacuum. If there's someone in your life who always requests that you, that you be the one to kill spiders, this is a very quick, easy, flawless way to do that. <laughs> and just keep things clean and it's always charged and you don't have to plug it in. It's great. Mine, mine is really similar to that. I mean, like a vacuum is something that everyone obviously sees the value in, but there's like a, a long list of like very, very essential like household items that I think most people are just like more awake to who are like adults. And I'm like not aware of any of them. So like my wife is always like showing me something on Amazon and I'm like, what is this thing? And she's like, it's this really basic thing you put in a home. And I'm always like, oh, like, we don't need that until I have it. And a great example of this recently in the past year is we got a leaf blower. And again, I was just like, why would anyone want to own yard tools? Like, why would somebody want that? But uh, I have a friend who works for DeWalt and he gave me a DeWalt leaf blower and it's like runs on a battery and it's pretty light. And the battery isn't super long, but because it's so light and also fairly powerful, like I can like run around the house on a battery charge and just have a, have a good old time. And I'm like, why did I never get one of these before? Like most people on our neighborhood have a leaf blower and I was just sleeping on this the whole time. And now I understand that like the, the power of ha like having like a good, well-made tool, um, it can be like game changing. And I'm just like wondering, like, what are the other obvious things I, I don't own that would be like similarly making me enjoy tasks that are awful? Speaking of technology that helps you avoid tasks that are awful, uh, just in the last year, I got a floor cleaning robot. I'm the last person who is in technology to have a robot that cleans my floors. And I love it. And it makes me have clean floors for most of the time. I'm in a one bedroom kind of open floor plan apartment and I'm mostly hardwood floors. And so I have uh, an iRobot Brava that cleans the floor and it's Ooh, amazing. I was thinking about getting one of those. So like, this is like, this is a, an intermission here. Like the, uh, the flip side of that question is like a regular person thing that I just started using that I absolutely hate that is not an upgrade to the old thing is uh google quizzes through google forms is like the worst thing i've ever used like 
Okay, and so like here's here's the thing. I yeah, don't but have you set up a quiz in Blackboard? Class. Dude. Okay, so here's what I used to use. This is back in 06 when I started teaching my class. I started using this piece of software called Star Quiz, and it's like the weird. Mike recently, my kids started just calling it the weird old quiz thing, and. <laughs> And it just generates like a really old website that's basic as heck. And it does everything I need. It has sized boxes to type in. I can do a matching question that just gives me like terms on one side and as many paragraphs of text on the other side as I want. I go to move all this stuff and it's, it's finally like stopped being supported. The dude just like switched the server off or whatever. And so I had to move all my stuff to Google quizzes. And I was like, this is hell. Like I am in hell. Like we are weird. This is the worst. I'm sorry. It's just like, I just want to make a matching question that says a term on one side and a big paragraph or a sentence. At least I can't do that. I can make these matrices of two word caveman answers to try to describe what the term that I'm trying to point them to is it's it's such a it's bad it's so bad it's bad and lazy and it makes me angry to use it so i just had to get that off my chest okay my third question <laughs> i don't i don't, don't want to hear any responses to that that's just how i feel so question number three this i've somebody posed this to me and i i gave a snappy answer right back but it's been stuck to me since then about machine learning and ai is it is it just fancy programming or is there more to it than that is there really a machine that's like learning in the way a human learns and my snappy answer was always it's just fancy programming it's still a stupid computer it's just a really fast light switch that's all it does that's all it is that's all it thinks and that's always been kind of my calming mantra around computers but it's been stuck to me that like that was the question was posed to me so is this is there something more there that I need to be aware of, or is it just fancy programming? I feel like John is probably the person to answer this, but I'm putting a link in the chat here, and Robbie, you can put it in show notes if you'd like. The old everything I know about machine learning, I learned from one of CGP Gray's videos on it's called How Machines Learn. And then he's got a footnote video called How Machines Really Learn. And I don't know that I could regurgitate that very well, but there, that's my contribution. Go watch the video that I just <laughs> shared with everybody. Uh -huh. There's a lot of different puckish things that I want to say about this. I, in terms of the state of the art now, right, Will, like, where are we now? I don't think it's too controversial for me to say that it's, you're, that you're dead on. I think it's still fancy programming. At some point, programming becomes so fancy that it's hard to distinguish from learning. We're not there yet. We're opening new doors. So I think Today, like if your definition of, if you're okay with, um, if your definition of learning, if like, if you're okay with calling it like regression or just providing, you know, relevant data from backward looking algorithms at very huge volumes of data, right? If that, if you're okay with calling that learning, then it's learning, but it's not going to produce something novel that wasn't already observed, right? Hmm. It's, it can still really do, you know, it can save humans a ton of time. And that's why I think it's okay to, to think about it as fancy programming, because that's what computers are good at, right? And they're doing repetitive tasks that humans don't like to do, right? So I think, yeah, in terms of where we are today, it's incredibly helpful. It's still just fancy programming. That doesn't mean that it's always going to be the case. I think uh, the, the only other thing I, I would, again, to be puckish here, I, I think there will be, uh, just like there is in, in computers now, right? That you have competition to see who can build the fastest computer, right? We're still, in, we're still seeing that competition dominate computing there will be competition to see who can be the most powerful with AI. And that will be left to nation states. It will be left to enormous corporations. For the consumer, this stuff will not be scary and it will be well understood and no more dangerous than your car, which is a very dangerous thing. Yeah, my gut response to this was also the fancy programming. I guess though, and maybe like I would even say, John, if you have a reaction to this, go for it. But like like the, the programming is, no matter how much you know, how much advanced it gets. It's like, it's all like sort of like made in the image of humans, right? Like, and I was kind of thinking down this path of like, okay, but like, we're the ones telling the machines how to program, you know? And, and then I started thinking about 
like my son or like a student of mine and like how much influence I have over the way that they learn uh, by modeling that and like teaching that myself, but also thinking ultimately like they are sort of their own individual self that will have to sort of come into their own. And I got kind of like in a spiral of thought thinking like, I don't know, maybe it is it is possible that um, we can get to a point where like, you know, we have sort of created the conditions in which a machine can be advanced enough that it can sort of start to make connections beyond what's, you know, modeled for it by humans. Yeah, I, I realized I should have given a concrete example. So where are we today? We are, where we are today is like made in the Im image of humans is a okay metaphor because think about um, image AI for correcting photo lighting. Very boring use case, right? Should be simple. It happens all the time. Almost any mobile device has onboard models that are doing image correction for you. Great. Now, if you train those models on a group of humans who have only a narrow subset of skin tones, right? It turns out your image correction is now biased. And so if you have the wrong skin tone, the image correction models won't make your photos look as good, right? That's where we are today. We're nowhere close to being at the point where your phone will say, hey, user, just so you know, you should you should unbias this data that I'm using to correct your <laughs> to correct your image, right? We're nowhere close to that. I, I think Will's question is is a really interesting one. And I think it it very quickly devolves into uh, some philosophical questioning of what it means to learn and how we assess that learning, which is an interesting thing that we do as as educators all the time anyway. Like how how do I know that my students can can, you know, form a major scale except by asking them. And I just have to take their word for the fact that they do understand what that means. And you know, that this is I think a long running problem in understanding what computers know and, and what it means for them to understand something going back to like natural language processing kinds of things that obviously people are still working on and but we've kind of had experience with things like this for for decades now there's a there's a great book by brian christian about this called the most human human about the the turing test and a, a competition of the Turing test, which is a basically a chat challenge between a human and a computer. And it's, it's a very interesting book. And it, it's, it's kind of computer book part philosophy book about how this, this quest for computer intelligence teaches us a lot about humans and human intelligence. And anyway, it's, it's a very interesting book. And, and re regarding fancy programming, I think there's something to be said for the, the human kind of programming a programmer. In, and in that sense, it reminds me of a lot of things that composer David Cope, who did a lot of work in early computer generated music in classical algorithms wrote about, and he talks about composing the composer as part of uh, the process. And he even compares, this is to something, I think I remember it was Robbie or Craig mentioned about like teaching kids. And, and in some ways that's a, like a form of programming. And he, he talks about the, the algorithmic processes that he uses in his computer music composition. And he says that these are basically the same processes that he feels like his brain is engaging in. And it's just a different way of processing the algorithm when you do it by hand with pencil and paper and when you have a computer do it. And so I think there, there are a lot of questions about what it means to be the originator of a, a, an idea like that and what it means for a, a system like a computer system or a human system to understand uh, knowledge. Good answers. Nice. I think that brings us to our next series of questions. Okay. I guess that's me. I've got them on my other monitor here. Um, what it, did you purchase any new hardware in 2021? What was your, what was your favorite thing that you purchased? And if you didn't, was there something that was announced in 2021 or something like that, that you're excited about? I will say my favorite piece of hardware that I got was my iPad mini and it's still relatively new. And even though I agree with Robbie that I wish there was a way to have less devices because I have an iPad Pro, an iPad mini, a Pro Max phone, a MacBook. I, I have a lot of devices, but man, this mini is great. It is just the best little consumption device and the Apple Pencil. I, I'm in love. So new iPad mini. Nice. The microphone I'm using now, SM7B, I think is an amazing mic. Um, specifically because it doesn't matter what room treatment you have or don't have, this thing functions great. Nice. And a ring light, anything that helps your whole sort of home studio lighting, it's just a huge upgrade now. 
Right on. I'm going to pander to Will a little bit here, but, but I'll first say I, as I, I'm pretty sure on this call, I'm the only person who has an, a Mac with an M1 chip in it. Is that, is that accurate? I've got one no? now. Okay. So I was going to say as resident M1 person, I felt maybe obligated to say that my new MacBook was, but because you have one, I'm going to use that as an excuse to just say like <laughs> that it's good. It's a great machine, but not provide any other detail or follow up. It's all of the things that people say that it is, but my kind of more like novel purchase of the year that unexpectedly was like, I kind of bought it like as a toy, but it unexpectedly changed the way or has been slowly changing the way that I do all sorts of other computer tasks and workflows on my computer is the Ableton push Two. Yeah. And, and I got it to just, you know, a friend of mine was selling it for relatively cheap. I've had a copy of Ableton live for a while and I didn't ever feel like I was learning its full potential. I feel somewhat obligated as, um, a musician and a teacher to understand the software better. And uh, I realized that what I didn't understand about able actually that I like knew more about Ableton than I thought I did. It was actually that I was just like not appreciating that with the push, like what the, what the push does, in my opinion, is it makes the DAW an instrument. It makes it a performable piece of software in a way that I can't like say that I have any other software on my computer, where I feel like my understanding of how to like manipulate it an instrument or a tool affects how much I can do proficiently, but also like expressively with the software. So like, I just, I just didn't know like the Ableton push can just do like operate on almost every part of Ableton live. And what's cool about it is that things that are ranging from very, very basic musical resources that I might use in a private lesson, all the way to things that might be more advanced are made better by the fact that I have like tactile buttons that I can do. So something as simple as like, I'm in my studio right now, which is where I keep it set up. And like a student is playing along to a metronome. Well, like traditionally I would just open up some metronome app, but I'm like fiddling with the keyboard and the mouse and like ma window managing and stuff. It doesn't matter like where, if like Ableton is like hidden or like closed, like this, there's a play button always accessible right on my desk. If the metronome is not even on in the software, I can turn it on in the software from a button right on the push. I can change the tempo of the metronome right from the dial in the upper left corner, like so much of it is just happening like with buttons. And I think that that's super cool. I can even like, because it's such a, it makes performing your musical ideas so, um, so possible without breaking a rhythmic flow. I can like even, you know, like, like we all like, no, like it's not a super good sell for like a fourth grader to be like, hey, you got to practice this one measure 50 times right now because that's how you get good. And then just have click, 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 click on the background. So I'll like, improvised accompaniment tracks to them. And I used to kind of like fiddle with this in my own time and then like email it to them. But now I can like just kind of like improvise grooves and bass lines and synth patches and all sorts of stuff like in time with them without them breaking. And they feel like they're all of a sudden like a part of this like developing electronic track where I'm just like kind of having fun. So that's my, that's my hack and my favorite hardware of the year, I think. Robbie, have you used the APC 40? The Not a ton, no. We should we should do another podcast sometime just talking about like Ableton controllers. Well, and I and I will. I have like we could do forty five minutes. Me just asking you what this thing can do that I could. Like, there's a lot of things I already know I want to do with it that I haven't really had the time to look up yet. Cool. Yeah, I mean that's that was a, that was a pretty good uh, representation of how a lot of pe people feel about it. It's like hard to know why you need it until you use it a bunch because it's pretty deep. Yeah. I will second everything that Craig said in his answer to his own question. My iPad mini is my favorite hardware acquisition of 2021. It is a beautiful device for doing reading on the web, for, for reading my Instapaper. It is the most adorable way to run Dorico. And I, I'm, a, I'm a very big fan of, of this tiny little machine. What, uh, what color did you get? I got Starlight and I have the bright orange smart cover. Nice. I'm, I'm rocking pink with the uh, lavender color. I'm... Nice. Uh, uh, is that everybody? I can't I remember. Think so. Did I do one? I don't think. No, we'll, I don't uh, think you did. We'll... No, you didn't. <laughs> Will, you're after me, oh, right? Yeah. Oh, right. Oh, right. It's yeah. a favorite hardware purchase. I guess we're, we're on the Apple thing right now. So I'll say my AirPods Max. Mm. I love these things. What, what do you so love nice. about them? Sell me on them. They Or don't. They, That's probably a bad idea. They... <laughs> feel great and sound great and the battery's great and the noise canceling is great and it's like it's just a pair of really really nice headphones that it's like they're overbuilt in such a way 
that I don't feel bad like walking through an airport with them just like hanging off my bag with the weird little case on them because it's like they're made out of like steel like these things mm -hmm. are like bulletproof love them <clears throat> nothing bad to say about airpods max nice cool all right did you start any hobbies in 2021 that could be anything you know collecting things or trying new things mine was kind of a return to an old hobby slash obsession i have been a big fan of tom ben's bags for yeah four or five years now and i went all out and just got so many bags this year the and i'm not i work from home now and i'm not traveling a whole lot and i think part of that is like aspirational because i so desperately want this pandemic to be over and to be able to like feel good going places i'm like doing stuff that i'll be able to use out there but i've gotten their cynic 30 backpack their Tekonaut like big travel duffel bag all sorts of pouches i now carry a man purse with me everywhere i go and i love it, it i don't know why it's culturally unacceptable because i or I don't care. I love it. It's so nice having a bag of my stuff. So yeah, all in on, I've been on the Tom Ben forums, obsessing over all of it. So that, that's I might been need to know what model that is, because we have one of their bags. We use it as actually as a diaper bag and it's got lots of good, well organized pockets in it. And I'm just like, hmm, I kind of like for my next backpack, want to consider one of their options. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk more I, I, because it all depends on what you need and, and how much you like, but probably the Synapse Cynic line is, is probably what you're looking for. I'll but. put, yeah, put, send me a couple of links. I'll put them in the show notes for people to go check out some of their, um, and, and they are and now when I do that, you're going to look and, and judge me for the amount of money I've spent on bags, but they are like made in America and they treat their workers well and things, you know, I'm not so gonna, yeah. They're they're expensive for a bag, but yes, I will I will send you a few few things to put in. I'm not gonna judge you for the bags. I'm gonna probably buy the bags. Is what's gonna happen. Well, I meant it more as the general you that might be listening to this, uh, but yes. Love, love the new hobby. Hobby. This is uh sometimes the boring ones are the important ones. For me, I think the, the most important one was um really trying to force myself along with the meditation to do some kind of daily journaling and daily planning, like actually planning out my day, which is not the same thing as just having a calendar. Yeah. Everyone has a calendar, but like that your calendar today doesn't align with your week's priorities and then making moves on that, on that. So when I actually do those things, it vastly improves my life, but I'm not a perfect, I don't do it every day. Yeah. I think for me, the actual answer to it is also some form of more consistent meditation. And then maybe also like indoor biking, just sort of more of like a, like a methodical approach to mental and physical health. But what I acted like was my hobby was electric cars. I do not own an electric car, but I'm in that phase of like, hmm, maybe one day, and I'm just doing all the research and the talking about and all that stuff that's, you know, that you would expect from someone who was a fan or, a, you know, going through a hobby or a phase. I'm like in that stage, because you kind of have to be, I guess, if you're going to like ever make up the car can be kind of an expensive big purchase. So I'm like thinking like, all right, I better start researching now because in a few years, you know, maybe my wife's car will need to be replaced. So there you have it. That's cool. That's that's kind of my hobby has been we got I, I got this classic car from my dad and kind of inherited this project of restoring it. And uh, uh, that's been kind of fun to learn how to drive an old car and like how old cars work. It's kind of fun. And dude, these bags are sweet. I'm looking at these bags you were just talking about. I, I've got I've got a bunch of in case bags. Mm -hmm. and they're all gray and black. And these are fun colors. That's pretty cool. Greg, give me the brand name one more time. It's Tom Ben. I'll put the, the link in, in the chat. B-I-H-N. And there actually is a dude named Tom Ben who's been designing bags since the 70s. And so he's a he's a person. They're all made in Seattle. <laughs> like it. But but yeah, I've got this uh this interesting car. It's a Fiat Dino Spider, and it's like a convertible from Fiat 1967. And it's got basically like it's the same engine as a Ferrari Dino. So it's it's like a pretty interesting car. And it's just it's so touchy. You just have to like learn how to 
I mean, it takes like 10 minutes for it to warm up right and start driving normal. And it's fun. You know, it's a quirky car. I feel like uh, Biff Tannen when I drive it. You know, I'm like, only I can start this car. So I guess I'll, 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 I'll go last. I, I didn't. I don't know if I would really consider this to be a hobby, but the thing that I started doing in, in 2021 was soda stream. So I <laughs> drink a lot of soda and seltzer water and, and I live in an apartment that doesn't have parking in the building. And so it's kind of a pain in the butt to drag like cans of, of liquids or bottles of liquids from the grocery store to my apartment. And so I got a soda stream and it is way easier to fill up tap water from the filter pitcher in my refrigerator and bake the soda as I need it. And I order the flavor things from the internet and I do not have to carry giant jugs of liquids from the grocery store to my parking garage, to my building, to my apartment. I don't think it saves me any money. If anything, it costs more. Oh, but no, 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 no. I can tell you that as, as someone who liked at the beginning of the lockdown, started our soda stream broke and we just started buying cans from whole foods we and we we would every couple every month or so we would eye a new soda stream on amazon but we'd be like no we don't have money for that and then like a couple months passed and i finally i asked my wife i was like wait how much are we spending on these little cans of fizzy water and we kind of were like looking through some grocery receipts and we were like oh man we could have bought like eight soda streams <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> Well, I have the Soda Stream Fizzy One Touch, which is the kind that plugs into the wall and you it doesn't like you don't hold the thing down for a certain amount. You just press the thing and it does its own juju. Hmm. All right. We have the one we did eventually get one and we have the one that's like apparently the most durable one, according to Amazon reviews. It's not electric. And I will just I'll just say I like it a lot. It's a lot better uh, built a lot better than our old one. But I do not feel secure every time because it like has an auto. There's no twisting motion. It has an auto lock. You like stick mm -hmm. the thing in, in it and is. then you just, yeah. And I, every time I snap it into place, I'm like, yeah, I'm definitely breaking this soda stream. I don't care what the Amazon <laughs> reviews say. Yeah. So this one, I'm, I'm trying to differentiate a little bit from, from the earlier question of what technology would yeah. you like will into existence? This is like, if it's rumored for 2022, if you follow Apple or just, you know, like could reasonably happen, like, what are you excited about? from a technology perspective in 2022 that that seems like it could could happen and my answer is this smart home conglomerate thing that's supposed to to happen between apple and google and all these folks so that they're all using the same protocol to talk to each other i can't even remember they've changed they gave it a cool marketing name and i don't remember what it's called matter yes yes that's it Thank you, Will. Yeah. And so you can get stuff that was originally designed to work just with Google, but then have it work with, you know, Apple Home and, and things like that. And I believe that's set to launch sometime in 2022. So also a severe thunderstorm is rolling through my area. So if I lose power, sorry about it. Oh, man. I, I, want, I want the Retina MacBook to come back. I want a little, a little baby Mac that is thin and colorful, like some of those rumors that show the little MacBook with a white bezel. That's what I want. That's reasonably possible. But if that's nothing, then like, you know, Tobias at Teenage Engineering told me that they have cool things they're working on for this year. So like, I don't know what that means, but I'm, I'm always looking forward to that. Those guys are crazy. <laughs> I like um, that. Oh, go ahead. I'm going to, yeah, we're, we're a lot of order here. I'm just going to jump on and say, I'm going to plus oh, oh, one. Oh, dude, wait, hang on. Let me add one more thing. I ordered a play date and it hasn't come yet. I was going to ask if that's what they meant. And I also ordered oh, well, a play date I, and I'm glad. That... I hope so. Yeah, I, I wanted, yeah, I ordered it like the day that they let you order it. So I'm looking forward to that too. <laughs> the only reason I was allowed to order a play date is because this is, this is, I've really been lucking out with some tech purchases lately. Like there've been a couple things where I'm like, there's no way I'm going to be allowed to do this. And then Mary is like more excited about it than me. And she's like, that is the cutest thing I've ever seen. I will play that. And I was like, Wait, are, you are you telling me I can, I can pre-order that? And she was like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, cool. So we're, oh, we're, I'm like air quoting here. That was her like birthday gift last year, but now it's going to really be like next year's birthday gift. Right. Yeah. Going. It's going to take forever to come out. Yeah. I'm going to plus one matter. And then I'm going to also say like, there are, yeah, there's a lot of like, buzz around this whole like augmented and virtual reality thing and i got more th thoughts on that than 
there's time to share, but I'll just say like, I, I will say publicly to everyone that I will not buy an Apple product that is virtual reality, but you know, I haven't seen the price tag yet. So I think I've never had like lower confidence that they'll nail something like that. But let's just say that there is some sort of like over the, you know, some sort of like Oculus style headset from Apple that has some sort of game story and is, you know, some sort of like first look into their their vision for that area. I don't know. It, it would be... Dude, dude, it, no, man. No, we've already talked about this. This is what it's going to be. They're going to say that screen we've been working on, we said we're going to work on some prosumer level screens that are cheaper. This is it. You put it on your face. It's a 70 inch screen for your Mac. That's all it does. Just projects a cool square of here's what my two dimensional desktop looks like, <laughs> but I can look around. That's all. That's all I want. That's all that it needs to be. And people would be like buying it because you just buy a little MacBook and then you strap on your sunglasses and now you've got a 30 inch screen done. I'll wait to see what actually it can be in practice. Because all the stuff that that I hear, like all the stuff that Apple is doing already with augmented reality seems like it would be much more tailored to an experience where it's like sort of overlaying information or entertainment over top of the real world. This sort of, sort of like fully immersive thing where it's like overtaking your whole face. I'm like skeptical yeah. about that, but like I'll- Dude, no, all I would have to do is have a camera on the front of it. And I can look at my living room with this virtual big giant Mac screen in front of me. That's all I need. That's it. And just like use the camera to make it look like I'm not having glasses on. I mean, at what at what point is there is are there chips powerful enough that like really you just need a phone in your pocket to power something like that? You don't even need to own a Mac. You can run Mac OS straight on your face. Something. That's what I mean. I, I, one... I, I, I feel like that's the angle they're going to take. Honestly, it's it's hard. I, I, in 2020, my I was super excited for um, I was like pretty impressed with the advances that had been made on the Oculus. And I was really excited for the future of VR. I, you know, I even tried, Will, the use case that you're talking about, you know, I was like, this is great. I don't have to like pay money for big screens anymore. The limitations that I ran into are it's incredibly uncomfortable still. You can only really use the thing for about an hour. The one it's thing really heavy. that gives me pause, though, is how much better Apple is at making hardware than like at most other companies. That's the one thing that makes me have a little glimmer of hope that it will actually be something. If it's as comfortable as these AirPods Max. Yeah. John, do you have an Oculus? I do. Like I said, I was I was super excited about it last year. And then I was one of the users who does it gung ho for like two weeks and then decides to put it down, uh, which uh, is apparently that's one very common like drop off trend. It's like very immersive and exciting for the first two weeks. You know, interesting. Well, hopefully somebody figures that out. It seems kind of compelling, better yeah. than lugging around big screens. That's for sure. So I guess for me, this is not very exciting to those of you that are already in this new brave new world. Uh, the thing that I am most excited about for me in 2022 is an M series Mac of some kind. I do not currently have one and I would like to change that in 2022. That's my answer too. Mine hasn't shipped yet, but the order is done. Are we on to John questions? I think we're on to John questions. What is your favorite VST plugin? It doesn't even have to be VST, right? There's other formats, but um, that you started using this year. Do you want to answer it first? since you're the asker of the question. Um, sure, there's there's so many. I'll just give, I'll just take one off the board. Uh, Soothe 2, if you do any kind of vocal processing, uh, Soothe 2 is an incredibly popular plugin that saves so much time doing uh, dynamic resonance balancing. It's super smart. Nice. You can throw it on there and spend zero time and it's gonna help. You can also spend a bunch of time and it's going to help more, but it's just really flexible, handy. I have very recently started using Band in a Box, which I bought to do some like Patreon specific content for the blog and the show. And um, actually, like I fully do not regret purchasing it. Um, it looks like it runs on Windows 98, but uh, it has like a crazy... Um, like samples, uh, both MIDI and like real instrumental performances that, uh, and I don't know if any of you have used like the iReal Pro app, which is like you give it a jazz chord progression for like a jazz standard uh, or you create your own. And then it sort of like imitates via MIDI, like the playback of like a bass player, a drummer, 
and a, a piano. And then it's got like maybe about like 14 or more different styles. You can do like up-tempo Latin, you can do alternating Latin swing, you can do ballad, you can do rock, you can do funk. But Band in a Box has like, I haven't counted them, but like, it would it would like just based on me scrolling through the list like it would appear like hundreds of different styles it can play in and there a lot of them are real actual recordings of people playing their instruments that will transpose into different keys and alternate the chords you can even like sort of like construct your own song with it like you can say hey i want to have this part of my song have a trombone solo and there's a style so to speak which includes like a real trombone player playing a solo but it will actually like adapt all the different samples that the trombone player recorded to the chord progression that you have input into band in a box so it's pretty it's pretty cool and all of it can run inside of a plugin in a digital audio workstation so i've been uh, making these play along tracks for my students to practice scales to and i made a bunch of like kind of trap style ones and uh, they've been asking for some like swing and some latin jazz and stuff and now i'm like i have like limitless possibility for what i can create which is pretty fun. It's awesome. I like that you give them trap beats and they're asking you for swing and Latin jazz. <laughs> I know it's funny, isn't it? Those are the next two. They that and uh, I think they want disco as well next. The uh, the uh, plugin that I have, most of the plugins I I use I should say are virtual instruments. So the one that I started using in 2021, there are a few of them that I started using in 21. But I think the the one that I think is the coolest and the most interesting to me is Piano Tech. So Piano Tech is from I think it's a French company, Mordart. Pretty much just keyboard virtual instruments, and their their controls for the keyboard instruments that they make are incredible. You can adjust the tuning of the keyboard in very fine details and you can adjust all kinds of things about how the thing works there's like a slider for like the the lid of the piano one of the things that i think is the coolest and something that i have not seen in any other piano virtual instrument that i've used before is it actually does account for sympathetic resonance so you can like silently depress a key in one octave and when you play keys in the other octaves you actually get the resonance on the notes that are in the overtone series of the the lower octave that you're playing it's kind of mind-blowing how mm. thoughtfully and how how much detail went into the the creation of this thing and so anyway that's, that's it, i think it's on version 7 piano tech 7 there are a number of different levels of licenses that come with different instruments that you can buy to use with their player they have an organ sim simulator that i've not used before but it looks and sounds pretty good and they have a few other instruments but I, the, uh, the main thing that they do are piano virtual instruments and i i think they're sample model i don't even think they're samples but they're they're really really amazing and i use them a lot for you know this is like way overkill for this but for teaching stuff online when i just need to do a quick demonstration and use loop back to get the audio from a thing into uh, a zoom call I just ran it ran Piano Tech as a standalone app instead of running it through a DAW or something. And it was really amazing. So Piano Tech from Mordart is awesome. Nice. I guess mine's not really a plugin, but all of the uh <clears throat> that so I've got an OP1 and an OPZ, and they both function as audio interfaces now. And that like, especially with the OP1, that kind of like totally changes how easy it is to just sketch out ideas on it and get it into a DAW to like put it together because with all those things it's like a, kind of a pain in the butt to like record layers on it but like that's pretty cool that's what I've been just kind of toying around personally with that okay here we go what was the song it doesn't have to be from 21 2021 so it can be any year that the song was published but what was the song in 2021 that you couldn't live without are you answering first before me or Oh gosh, did I answer my own question yet? I'm just gonna say it was like the Dirty Loop single off their latest album, Turbo. Tasty. I, I just wanted to, you know, every now and then it's like, I know what the spirit of this question is and how I could answer it, but I'm gonna like reinterpret it or re-engineer it, so to speak, to say that, you know, like, I don't know. I was thinking, I was like, what, when, what does it mean for a song to like change my life. And I got thinking about all the times this year that I had a small child who was losing his mind until I either played or sang the song, The Wheels on the Bus. And that was a management technique for calming or focusing him. And I am gonna say The Wheels on the Bus. If you really need to know a particular version, I'm gonna tell you the version that gets played around the house 
is the Coco Melon one. And I don't want to hear anything from any of you about that Coco Melon <laughs> gets played. A little bit like Robbie, mine is, is more of a, a personal story kind of thing. When I started my job at Wichita State University in 2018, I spent time going through, if, you, if any of you have ever been on this side of university teaching, getting a new course in the catalog and set up and running is like kind of a huge ordeal that takes like basically a year at least to go through the process. So anyway, I, we did not have a new music ensemble. I went through the process of getting a new music ensemble added. It's inaugural season was uh, 2020 to 2021. So we did not get to have any live performances with an audience of this, this brand new new music ensemble. And so we finally got to do that this past fall to have a live performance with people in the audience. And so the the thing that the 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 song that was super important to me was the the piece that we we kind of started our our existence with and that's julius eastman's stay on it so it's a very cool kind of early minimalist piece of music by an often and wrongly overlooked composer julius eastman stay on it and we also did some like weird free improvisation stuff as a group, which was which was a lot of fun using a, a structured improvisation system called sound painting, which I would love to talk more about some other time. But the song for me is Julius Eastman's Stay On It. Animal Collective, My Girls. And it's like not a new song, but like, I don't know, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of the personal story still. It's like this year, it was like I had ideas and crazy ambition and things to try some different things and like it kind of led me back to where I am now and I've just been kind of like trying to appreciate what I have and like just um you know kind of you know realizing that there's you know you don't have to keep climbing and climbing and climbing you can be happy with where you're at and I am happy with where I'm at so that song kind of puts me there Awesome. says something he just needs four walls and adobe slats it's a good song i was gonna go with a song off of my favorite album of the year but i feel like that spoils it so i'm gonna go along the same lane as robbie so i have to deal with a lot of crappy kids music as well but a movie came out this fall on netflix called vivo and lin-manuel miranda is the star and did the soundtrack and if you ever wanted Hamilton, which I'm Hamilton obsessed, I, I love, love, love Hamilton. If you ever wanted Hamilton to be kid appropriate and about a kinkajou, the small raccoon related rodent sort of thing, then this is the musical for you. And it's it's his just ridiculous rhymes and rapping, but set for kids instead of Hamilton. And having that that my kids got obsessed with to be able to listen to constantly and having that kind of quality, but still be enjoyable. And we all sing it together. And one of my kids dressed up as Vivo for Halloween. And like, it made things a lot of fun and for us to be able to share that and not just Coco Melon. So uh, v- I, I, if I pick a song, the, the opening song, I think it's called Two of a Kind or something like that. But the opening introduction song is, is great. The whole soundtrack's great. Awesome. Is that, okay. What is the best 2021 hack you discovered for getting organized? I'm just going to say this is an ongoing process. It's by no means complete, but I'm trying to learn my way around cable management, which I've been putting off my whole life. And now it's just coming to a point where I can no longer resist the tide. So I think the best hack is these little, uh, let me find one for you. These are the fastest things that I have found for cable management. Like these like little elastic, they come off and on any, any cable snake that you have super quick and you can just tighten them and loosen them. It's faster than all the Velcro ones I've tried. It's faster than, you know, any other. So these little $3 elastic cords help me, help me with that. Right. Yeah. My, my, my hack is a software hack and it's going to come back all the way back to my like sticky software workflow of the, of the year, which is using like personal knowledge management. So like when you use an app that can link notes to other notes, you can also create a link, you know, into another 
kind of related piece of software. So my hack of the year so far is just linking all of the things, like saying, okay, I've got this little bit of data, it's a document, I've got this little bit of data, it's a note, I've got this little bit of data, it's a task. And like choosing apps and choosing software that supports a feature where basically I can generate a URL that when clicked will just take me not to a website, but like just take me like to the content directly with an app, deep linking, so to speak. So like my, I've got an app, Obsidian, for like taking notes. I've got one for checkable little tasks called OmniFocus. And I got another one that is called Dev and Think, which is sort of like, I don't know if everyone, you know, for those listening, if you remember Evernote, kind of like this idea of just having like an everything bucket, you can throw any kind of data at it, website, links, PDFs, emails, even like it can just documents, it can like take whatever kind of files you throw into it, and then kind of organize them into groups, you can tag them and all that stuff. So what I've kind of done is like a tag, a group, or a document that's in this database can also be linked. So I've sort of like started so that I don't lose my place in my different projects I'm managing, I've sort of just started like leaving little bread breadcrumbs for myself. So like a note will have a link to a related task in it, or a task will have a link to a related note. Or like if I'm working on a project that involves a handful of documents, I'll create a link to that handful of documents inside of a note that I'm taking to track my progress on that. So just kind of like linking all the stuff together. It's kind of, I've sort of made like one giant super app out of a handful of other apps that support this kind of feature. For me, and I, I, I know this is an app that I already mentioned uh, already, and it's something that Robbie and I have spent a lot of time talking about recently. Uh, the the thing that I have done a lot of is, is using an app called Craft. The thing that I like the most about craft is that I can turn any note into a very simple and kind of nice looking web page that I can send to people. And when I'm collaborating with other people, particularly people who are unlikely to want to actually co-edit a document with me, I take my notes in craft so that I can share with everybody else that I am collaborating with. And I don't put the information in the email because it gets lost and it gets, you know, it, with all the reply alls, it gets if, if there's ever any change that needs to be made or whatever, if I just put a link there and somebody needs to refer to it later, I can update it, I can change it. It's a, it's a great way that I can send stuff to students in different ways that are in different sections or different classes or even in classes that I am not teaching but need to have information that I am kind of the master of. I can put those in craft notes and send those out to people and I don't need to like update you know, something changes with the way we're setting up some particular software. I don't need to update all the instructors who are responsible for it. I can just change it in this thing and send them a note, say, hey, I changed this. And as long as they're just linking to that same craft page in, in their course materials, it's all in one place. And I don't have lots of different copies of things floating around everywhere because that is the the death of, of any kind of collaborative system is outdated information. Well, was I supposed to answer? Wait, hold up, what's the question? Getting organized. Oh, geez. Yes. I'm not that organized. So, I mean, I guess like a shared Google Doc and a phone call is usually how I get organized when like a meeting's coming up or something. But like, I don't, I don't know. I feel like uh, for me, adding tools to that problem like complicates it. So like, I try to keep it like whatever is like right in front of me. So whatever can keep it right in front of me is, is pretty good. I've, I feel like like a lot of the like apps and tools for like doing to-do lists and things have like, they're like alarm clocks that I don't want to wake up to. It's like, I eventually like tune them out after a while. So like, like the to-dos was good for a while. And then it's like, I just start ignoring them. And then it's like, you know, calendar events. If it's not right in front of me, I don't do it. So that's my new way of getting organized is if I don't want to do it, I don't do it. If I want to do it, I'll do it. There it is. It's a hack. Life hack. <laughs> Ignore unwanted tasks. That's the, uh, that's the life hack. Awesome. So you're saying that you are not currently using any personal knowledge management software. No, I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I, I have, I, I mean, I have the to-do list still that reminds me to you know, clean the hot tub every week or whatever, but like, as far as like getting things done from day to day, I mean, it's like, it's emails. Emails is the to-do list, right? And it's just like emails. I actually like bought that shirt from The Verge that just says email on it. You know, it just <laughs> says the word, it says the word emails or something. Like I bought that because it's like, that's, I feel like we should have a four day work week, but keep day number five just for emails because that's really like part of the job. 
it's just emails. I'm working on trying to get like a music department secretary so I don't have to do as many emails anymore. <laughs> if they don't give me one, I might just pay her out of my pocket. Just do my emails for me. Nice. Oh. I, I feel like I have been less organized in 2021 than ever. And some of that's just like the rate of growth that the company I work at has had and, and just some changes that have required me to adapt, but I have not adapted at the speed that I needed to. But I've found that on days when... I don't, even if I have it in a digital task management system, having a to-do list like in front of me on a sheet of paper that I can work off of and keeping it right here instead of it getting buried behind other windows on my Mac or things like that, I'm more productive and I need to do that more in 2022 because it helps a lot when I actually choose to do it. Totally. Uh, right. that's it. Here's... Go ahead. Go ahead, Robbie. Did you, did you not go? Did you not answer that question? No, I did. Oh, okay, cool. I was just gonna say we're at, I think we've reached the off topic section and then there's yes. still like <laughs> yearly picks. Can uh, I know not all of you have the same amount of time and obviously like we could keep going at this pace for a while. I would like to make a suggestion, actually a couple of suggestions with how we proceed and then get your take. We we can cut some stuff or if I impose a very strict time limit with zero explanation on our answers, I think we can power through the rest of this. I'm down. Cool. It will pay me to sure. not talk about video games and <clears throat> TV shows beyond that limit. But I'm going to say, like, can the answers to the questions be kept under 10 seconds? Is that possible? Totally. And then just leave the people wanting more. Done. Gotcha. I'm in. I think we, I think we got this. I think yeah. we got this. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. We'll do fun uh, ones. So the question is... And I worded this very carefully, uh, but it's open to extreme interpretation. What is the most valuable TV show that you discovered in 2021? For, for Queens. First. There you go. Robbie, what's yours? I'm realizing that I didn't actually think about. Or right, we'll come back. <laughs> come back I don't know me. what valuable means. I didn't start too many new TV shows. It's either Loki or Foundation. Loki was good. Mine is uh, Doom Patrol. On only murders in the building on Hulu. I did say discovered in 2021, so I guess I'm going to, I'm going to go with the expanse. You know, I, it's been a while since uh, I've had anything lengthy, sort of a serial drama that, that hooks me into its world and it's got a lot of good world building and it's a little bleak, but I like the ride that I'm on. It ends, it's in its final season. So, and it's on Amazon prime. So I think it's my turn. I think everybody answered Robbie's question, right? Yes. Okay, so I am not a gamer. I do not have any gaming consoles, nor do I have a Windows PC. But I feel like I am missing important pieces of culture because I do not game. I think they are as important as film or television or movies or novels or whatever. So what, what game should I be playing? Animal Crossing, for me, is my addiction and has been for a while. Yeah, you definitely want to switch. And if you want an immersive single-player Switch title, you want Zelda. If you want a multiplayer addictive game, Overcooked 2 would be my vote. Yeah, since Robbie gonna, took... I, I, oh, go ahead. Will. I'm going to say I got... My son got an Xbox for his birthday, and it's very impressive. Uh, the Star Wars Squadrons game is pretty sweet. Ooh, yeah. Since Robbie took mine, I'll say if you're, if you're specifically trying to catch up on culture stuff, I feel like the following come up very frequently. So Skyrim, Dark Souls, Fortnite, League of Legends... Okay. Noted. Thank you. I don't have an answer to this because that's why I asked. You can play Skyrim on any, almost anything now. I also do have, I have Stadia. I've, I've played Google Stadia. It actually works very well. Nice. I always joke that playing Skyrim is like, it's like playing in a really, really wide, but shallow pond, but that very shallow pond I spent like a hundred hours of my life in. So <laughs> take with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go for it. Will. Okay, will we become AIs like in the Matrix, or will we outlaw AIs like in Dune, or will we have a tepid relationship with robots like in Foundation? Ten seconds or less, everyone. Will, go. Okay, Turn. I think it'll be tepid. It's going to be tepid. Foundation's tepid. I, I agree, tepid foundation. I, I would say, I think that we already have that kind of relationship to robots. The only, the only way I would go maybe Matrix is if you subscribe to the belief that the Matrix is actually a metaphor for how we already live and i'm just gonna leave it at that <laughs> i am going to this is tangential the thing that i want from the matrix is to be able to plug a thing into the back of my skull and have skills immediately implanted into my body and muscles and i would like to be able to play the piano very well well this goes back to our earlier answers a little bit so i think for most of us it will be tepid like in foundation but if you're a nation state or some kind of international conglomerate 
it will be fighting over what should be allowed, what what is allowed to be weaponized, what is allowed to be used in the theater. Mm. Yeah. Good call. Good call. I feel like the I feel like Dune is the likely outcome after a big conflict, honestly. But I don't think I don't want it to turn out that way. <laughs> Good question. What are some podcasts, maybe a podcast now, uh, that you enjoyed in 2021? I will say season three of The Plot Thickens by Turner Classic Movies was all about, it was a biography of Lucille Ball, and it was super fascinating. So Nice. I will say Hit Parade. It is a like pop music, billboard history, recent, recent music history kind of podcast, and I can't get enough of that thing. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to Sound Expertise, which is a musicology podcast hosted by Dr. Will Robin, who's over here at the University of Maryland. And he did a, a really good job getting a lot of compelling topics and guests for his um, first two seasons of that show. Uh, if you're looking for something more fun, there's like a show I like called Robot or Not, which in under five minutes, um, that the different topics are addressed in that context. I won't say anything more because it's means a little bit more to me than that, but that's, a real, oh, the episodes are super short, easy to get into, see if you like it or not. You know, I always end up going back to the, the Harry Shearer show, the show, even though it's like ancient, it's not really a podcast, but it is a podcast. I don't know why I just find his voice comforting. I hesitate to recommend this to anyone because it's really weird and meandery and doesn't make any sense, but I love Do By Friday with Merlin Mann and Alex Cox. It is a very self-referential and very referential to about a thousand other podcasts. And so it's kind of weird in that regard. One of the podcasts that they reference a lot that, that I also love is called Election Profit Makers, which is just a weird tangentially politics related show that is hilarious. Nice. Cool. All right. Best cooking hack in 2021? That's a, actually a really good question, I think. Uh, mine, what did I say mine was? Come back to me. I forgot mine. It's a really good question. My, um, I actually think my answer is boring, which is that, you know, I want like to live in this universe where the cooking, like cooking is this extension of my creativity and my craft. And like, I'm just like making different unique things all the time and like developing my skills and trying new things. But in reality, the thing that actually has the biggest, most positive impact on my life is having one or two of my meals a day be planned in advance. And uh, you can like make a giant frittata at the beginning of the week and a bunch of, uh, fish salad, you know, like some salmon salad or some tuna salad or some mackerel. It goes real well with some mayonnaise, just saying, and some lettuce and some veggies. So that's my thing is meal planning. Just subscribe to Blue Apron. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Then you don't have to think ever. And then sharpen your knives and season your cast iron pan. For, for me, this is not a new 2021 thing, but, and I know a lot of people do this already, but kitchen scales, super cheap like 20, 25 hmm. bucks and do everything by mass instead of volume. And you don't have to watch as much stuff because you don't have to use all the measuring cups. Robbie, you stole mine. I was going to go with meal planning as well. We buy, like we plan out a whole week on Sundays, buy all the groceries we need, and then we're good to go. I remember yeah. mine. It's just a, a salmon recipe that I always know that I will always love and be in the mood for no matter what. And it's just four ingredients. It's um, marin, uh, some kind like, miso any soy sauce that you already have and um like a sake that's Fun it fact, very john, simple very tasty john gave me the recipe that i have which is the best steak that i can cook nice um all right i'm gonna impose an even stricter time limit on these next three topics which kills me inside but we're at like a quite extreme length of recording time already you are allowed no explanation for your album and an app pick of the year you just but i'll link them all in the show notes if your tech tip requires brief explanation for someone to understand what it is go for it we're gonna start with album and this was very difficult for me drummer nate smith his album kinfolk 2 very very good nice just going around on albums for yeah Okay, not a new album, but a classic Stevie Wonder talking book. Magdalena Bay, Mercurial World. John Mayer, Sob Rock. Dirty Loops, Turbo. Mm, all right, all linked in the notes. Go, go listen to them, everyone. All right, next up is app of the year. So something that's changed your year. I'm gonna start on this one. I kind of hinted at it earlier, Obsidian and Craft. Actually, I'm just gonna pick Obsidian because I have a feeling one of you might wanna pick Craft. Obsidian is 
is it for me. It's changed the way I work the most. Uh, I would pick Graph, but we've talked about it enough already. I'm going to say Finn, which is a speech timer, and it lets you count down a timer, and you can synchronize that timer on a lot of different screens so different people can see it and control it. OPZ app is how we do visuals with EMG now, and it's really fun. Pixelmator photo for iPhone that just released. Whatever. They changed their names. Yeah. They need to, they need to get their naming down. They have yeah. like too many confusing different versions of their apps, but their apps are all killer. Moleskin Actions. It's my go-to to-do app now. I use it every day. All right. This brings us to our final segment of the year. Tech tip of the year. I am going to say probably for me using the focus modes, which is a new feature of iOS and Mac OS. I'll link some episodes of this show where you can hear me talk about more specifically how I use them. But basically, you create your own do not disturb modes. And based on context, you can choose who can or cannot notify your phone and which apps can be used. You can even have a specific page of your home screen be the only visible home screen depending on your mode. So like I've got one for teaching, I've got one for like crunching through some email, one for like just not wanting to be bothered. It's it's actually like brought a little bit of sanity into my work where I didn't always have it. There's a great tool for online shopping on amazon.com with a very stupid name, camelcamelcamel.com. There are two components. Basically there's a browser plugin where you can, when you're looking at any item on Amazon, click a little button and it will show you a historical graph of the price of that thing. As you know, prices on things pretty randomly on Amazon. And so you can see if it has gone up recently and you should wait. The other thing that you can do is have it watch the price for things and send you an email or update an RSS feed that you can subscribe to in your feed readers when a price hits a certain point that you are interested in. You can set these watches up manually, or you can just have it watch your Amazon wish list. I already described the OBS cam thing earlier, but I guess I'll expand it and just say, use OBS for everything. It's like a Swiss army knife, display capture, getting the camera input, uh, streaming stuff, recording stuff. It's its all there. I will say uh, I use a service called Feedbin. And not only can you subscribe to blogs and things via RSS, but you can subscribe to Twitter accounts and uh, get email newsletters sent there. So when I'm trying to cut back on my consumption a little bit at the beginning of the year, I can put like super key Twitter accounts, newsletters, and certain blogs and have it all in one spot not have to go look for it and then also cut back. In iOS, when, when you're, whenever you're navigating text, normally you would like press and hold to like select a word or something. Just hold down the space bar yes. and then start dragging your finger around on the screen. It is so much easier to find that character that you need to correct than before. That was an eye opener when I found out that that existed. All of you are on the internet and all of your fine work and you know the things that you're kind of doing that you're putting forth publicly will be linked in the show notes did anyone want to like say any closing remarks about like where someone can know you just want me to like i'll just link it okay i'll also link i will link episodes that you all have appeared on they range quite a bit in topics and scope but yeah this was fun. quality was fun too and quality <laughs> this has been a uh, super fun I'm meeting meeting y'all for the first time yeah. This was great. Yeah, this was fun. I, yeah, I appreciate you all doing it. I knew it would go a little long. I think probably you all had that idea too. So thank you for hanging with me for uh, for this length. So I have nothing else. Is there anything I should say? Happy New Year. All right, I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music at Tech Talk. And also, thanks to this episode's sponsor, Light the Music. You can find them at lightthemusic.com. You can find the show's page, show notes for this episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to blog posts through an RSS app of your choice, and you can subscribe to the podcast in a podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. Please rate and review the show and the podcast app you use. It absolutely helps. It will only take a second and a few taps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about the show. You can learn more about my teaching and music career at RobbieBurns.com. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube at Robbie Burns. Please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash music ed tech talk. All support tiers get perks, but even the base tier gets you a monthly video update with app and music recommendations and tech tips and access to the music ed tech talk discord community where you can chat with other supporters and guests of the show about music, apps, pedagogy, lesson ideas, tech support, and more. It's a fun place to be. All right. And we'll see you next time.